So last night um, we did a a character gen for a fifth edition of Vampire the Masquerade game that I'm going to be running soon. I'm going to be running that bi-weekly. So very much looking forward to that. And we did the, I suppose, the, the by now traditional sort of session zero idea where you get everyone together and you spend a whole session creating the characters so creating a group of characters that everyone's going to be happy with, working out connections between them, stuff like that. The idea being that when you come to the actual first session, you don't have to spend any time on that. You've got it all done. You just jump straight into the game, happy days, and off you go. Now, myself and Johannes have done the character gen for 5th edition Vampire a number of times before. And it's I think it'd be fair to say it's a, a sort of pretty involved process Johannes yeah uh, and that is particularly because at least in in v5 it does encompass uh, a lot more than just figuring out a bunch of stats for your own character yeah very much so I mean previous versions of the previous editions of Vampire the Masquerade which we'll but we're both pretty au fait with Eventually, you get down to like, you just go, right, I've got this many dots to bank on my sheet. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, you, eventually, yeah eventually you're just like, okay, seven, five, three, and then what, yeah. 11, nine, seven, was it for the. Yeah, for the it might have been 11, nine, five, but it was something like yeah, that. Yeah, uh, some, something like that. And then, like, yeah, toss oh, on your. Three dots your, of disciplines, five yeah. dots of backgrounds, boom. Yeah, yeah. And, just, yeah, and, um, what, like 10 XP? What was it? 15? I forget. Yeah, it's exactly. Like but, it, it, like, Eventually, it was literally just that. It's just like fill out a lottery ticket, and then you're like, ah, <laughs> I'm I'm done. But of course, that's with uh, I, and I hesitate to even estimate this, but it's it's at least several decades of experience. Yeah, by that, now, that, 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 that's <laughs> with a lot of experience. And I'm I'm sure so going forward, if I run like more vampire games, I'd get quicker at doing the like the character gen sessions for this, but. Being unfamiliar with it, certainly from the point of view of like being the GM, I want to take a slightly more sort of leisurely wander through it. And also, it's a, a new group. Obviously, um, we, had, we had Ambrose and we had yourself, who I've gamed with before. Yeah. We had a couple of new players. And obviously, group dynamics can be very different when you get like groups of people. So it's also handy to sort of make it slightly more leisurely for that so people have time to sort of digest and have time to think about their characters as well as like get to chat with the other people because you're going to be playing like a coterie or a group of vampires ostensibly working together for some goal. Now, the one of the things I like about V5 is the character gen. Although you are genning your character, a lot of the a lot of the things you select sort of lead on to you having various NPCs or sort of people associated with your character. So when you're picking your backgrounds, um, you pick your predator type, which is how to feed. That might give you certain backgrounds like enemies or allies or contacts, all of which the game encourages you to sort of build a relationship map showing those people a link to the character. Now, we did this on sort of like a fairly simple Roll20 map, just like dropping icons on there and drawing lines to like link them up. But I really like the fact that effectively it allows you to generate enough sort of stuff at the start of the game that you have uh, almost like a, a very de very detailed sort of like cast of characters. And I don't mean just literally like the player character, but the non-player characters as well when you go into the game. So a lot of games, it sometimes feels like you make the player character, then they sort of wander out onto a, a fairly blank stage, like maybe a bit of scenery, mm -hmm. to use yeah. like a theatre metaphor. And then the GM is sort of in the wings, like quickly trying to like get, get some like bit players, like and some like background artists, like ready and costumed, and like get them out on the stage and mm -hmm. just you know, see what works, and we'll take it from there. Whereas with this game, having sort of been through the generation process it feels like I've already got a lot of stuff that I can pull on to get that first session developed. And I know that it's stuff that you guys know about as players and a lot of which you've chosen because you've chosen the background. Yeah. So presumably, yeah, you, you picked it. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So presumably you at least have some sort of interest in it because otherwise, yeah. I mean, yeah. looking at the map on here, I can see 
your character has like the least NPCs associated mm-hmm. just because that's how it went with you pick. But even you've got four NPCs associated with your character. Yeah, now, and uh, and if if this is the map, uh, well, rather the um, uh, the layout from last night, it yeah. should have one more touchstone as well because I, I picked all three. And then the one goal. So, but yeah, still, uh, I'm I'm the one with the least uh, of these, and uh, so that's if I have. Although I do believe having the extra one there would bring you up to five, yeah. and basically all of the player characters have five NPCs with them, with the exception of Ambrose who has six. So yeah. everyone's got roughly this sort of like little cast of like side characters yeah. associated with them. Now. That those can be like weird things. Like we've got Ed's character. He he, he took a, a merit, which means he can't be afflicted by the blood bond. He's unbondable. And one of the the sort of nice little sort of flourishes they mention in that that it makes your blood extremely interesting to alchemists and sorcerers and other vampires who want to know why you're not affected by the blood bond. Something that affects virtually every other vampire in existence. So he's gone for one of his enemy flaws being a a human alchemist or chemist like a scientist who in the past got hold of some of his blood noticed like unusual genetic properties in it and now wants to track him down to like get to the source of that blood so we've already got without me really doing anything there we've Mm -hmm. already got one antagonist set up one sort of little story thread that we can pull on and obviously other if this person comes after him, other people will get involved, other NPCs, the player characters will get involved. And that's without me having to just sit down at the start like a blank piece of paper and like, right, I need some NPCs for this vampire. Yeah, and, and, and I need a, a story which is already built into its character. There's a storyline there that we can explore without any of your input. That's it, exactly. Now, the, the character sheet, I mean, we've been using uh, an excellent character sheet that's on Roll20, which is extremely handy. And the actual, the actual sort of stats, you know, the attributes and the skills will be fairly familiar to anyone who's played previous versions. You have a rating, you put your dots in it, you pair an attribute with a skill, that's what you roll as a dice pool. Absolutely grand. There's a few little tweaks and differences to it as they've got on. Obviously, we're not going to go in depth into all the mechanics here but it'll be fairly familiar to anyone but what i think is really sort of makes it st- one of the things that makes it stand out for me like i say is this idea that uh, a lot of the a lot of the the merits the flaws um touchstones which we might go into a bit later which are people who embody your um sort of aspects of your humanity sort of uh, tenants that you cling to to like maintain your humanity in the face of the beast you, for each of those tenants like one to three you have a person a human that embodies that tenant and as, as we discussed last night it does, this doesn't necessarily have to be someone who's your best buddy or someone you really like and get on with it could be someone you absolutely hate but they are important to you and they represent something of humanity. Mm -hmm. And that to me, in addition to providing these NPCs, which generate plot, it's a lot more sort of stimulating and appealing to me than simply someone going, Oh, I've got, I've got four dots of humanity. That means as long as I don't go out and I don't go out and rob somewhere or kill anyone, I'm fine. Yeah. I'm, I'm good. Yeah. And I, I've often heard the criticism leveled against sort of previous versions that although it's supposed to be like a game of personal horror, you know, uh, the, these creatures struggling with this beast and trying to maintain their humanity as it slowly erodes and slips away, that quite often the games basically just became like, oh, you're blood-powered superhero. You drink blood every now and again, but as long as you don't go too evil, you're fine and you get cool powers. Uh-huh. Whereas, and, and I think part of that is down to the fact that humanity in previous games was just like a number. And it, I find it very difficult personally. I, I, I mean, I'm a big fan of abstraction in role play games in general, but mm-hmm. I find it difficult if you say to me like, oh, this vampire's got humanity three and this vampire's got humanity four, that just off the, off the, off the bat, that doesn't really tell me a great deal. I have difficulty visualizing like how humane a humanity for person is. Yeah, and there's there's a lot to be said for the uh, the sort of triggers for when your humanity was affected in some way in previous editions of Vampire, and it, it is it's not like they were horrid in my opinion, but they did lack 
something in there to put the extra yeah. spice. Like it was a it was a system and it functioned. However, for me, it did lack like some. Uh, I suppose momentum really uh, yeah. had some some vitality that would have like put it to the front uh, more than it it did because it's it yeah. was it, it didn't intrude uh, in the lives of of the characters as much as it does in V five through the touchstones that you have the people that you interact with uh, yeah. that are important to the upkeep of your the remains of your humanity. Well, that's it. I mean, if, if someone was to ask me, sort of like, what's the difference between the, the the new version of Vampire and that previous version? Obviously, you could point to the background and the timeline moving on and stuff like that. But one of the big things for me was the people who've written it have obviously taken what they consider to be the good bits of previous World of Darkness. So they've looked at the attribute and skill system and gone, that's serviceable, it works, it does what it's supposed to. But then they've just sort of looked at everything and gone, right, well, how can we how can we make it more meaningful in the game? And how can we make it so it generates game content rather than it simply being like a number rating? Yeah. And, and a part of that, sorry. To no, I was going to say, the, yeah. I think that's a great thing personally. Yeah, and uh, a continuation of the sh- same sort of like design topic is they included the um, uh, Watch Me Struggle now to remember the uh, correct terms here. So bestial failure and uh, messy critical. So both of those, yeah, the hints in the name, uh, either you succeeded uh, really well, which is the messy critical, or you failed really bad, which is the bestial failure. And then, as an additional <laughs> sort of defining thing in both of those, is your vampiric nature gets the the better of you. Like the yeah. the person in you is less in that action than the uh, the actual like cannibal serial killer monster that you are now. Uh, so in in uh, messy critical, the idea is that. Yeah, you rolled a critical hit. However, one of these dice that you rolled was your hunger dice. So basically the influence of your worst nature. Yeah. That was one of the things that got you the critical. As a result, the critical thing, the, the great success that you had is flavored by the worst in you. So maybe, yeah, you're, you're, in a, you're a, normally a studious, uh, I don't know, vampire historian and you're in the library like doing your research and you roll a mess, messy critical yeah, you, you did the thing. You you figured out like who the progenitor of vampires is or something, mm-hmm. but you destroyed the library in the progress. Like you ripped through books in uh, in frustration when they didn't have the information, and then you found the thing and you you hold the sacred book of vampires aloft in victory, and then look about you and you have destroyed the entire rest of the library. Uh, and I presume <laughs> it, I presume if you were going to do like a, a messy failure, that'd be something like you're looking for the book, you've not found it. But you're maybe you're like disturbed by a night watchman or something yeah. like flashes a torch at you and you just like lose your yeah. shit. And that person and, is going to be in seven different locations by the end of the night. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, pr- pr- yeah, I was going to say perhaps we should um, we should discuss yeah. like the hunger dice a bit because the yeah. the sort of the blood mechanics are a, a little different. Now in previous versions you had a blood pool which was a pool of points representing how much blood you got. I believe it was 10 normally. Yeah. And then when you spent blood on your disciplines, etc., your blood pool ticked down. When you had to make certain like frenzy checks, when you were exposed to certain stimuli, you got sort of like penalties. I believe like you could only roll a maximum number of dice equal to your blood pool. So the less blood you had in you, the more difficult to resist frenzy. Now, in the new game, you, you don't have a blood pool. You have your hunger rating, which I believe starts at 1%. And what, um, yeah, I correct? think it's, I think it's, uh, I don't recall the actual thing, but I've seen people, uh, like roll randomly during first session, like being like, like, let's roll, uh, a D 10 divided by two. And that's how much hunger you have as yeah. a, like the starting point, which is, is random, but we could also start with just one. Yeah. And basically the more, the more rating you have in hunger, obviously represents the fact that you're hungrier. Now, I don't believe you can ever re- normally if you're just like feeding off people and you're being a bit careful, you can't reduce this below one representing the fact that you're always slightly hungry. You're a vampire. Yeah. Yeah. The only way to reduce it to zero is to literally like drain someone dry and kill yeah. them. Yeah. Murder. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which sort of leans you towards like the darker side of being a vampire. Like if you ever want to completely like silence that nagging hunger, 
someone's going to die for it, yep. which I like because it's it's not as abstract as like, oh, I've just got like a pool of dice, and uh, sorry, a pool of blood points, and you often sort of think like, oh, well, how many blood points does like a gorilla have? How many, uh, how many blood points does this have? How many blood points does that have? Whereas in this, it seems more like the hunger is like a, a sort of driving force rather than it just being like a pool of blood that slowly ticks away. It's something that's like building up and slowly consuming you. Yeah, yeah. If One remember, of the, uh, sorry, ahead. you go. No, I was just going to say that the comparison that I've heard a lot uh, between the blood pool and hunger yeah. is blood pool is basically a gas tank that you fill up when, when you need to. And then uh, hunger is, uh, I don't remember the metaphors for it, but basically not that. So uh, whereas the blood pool, you could sort of like set on the side because it, 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 it wasn't really a, a thing. Uh, it didn't intrude again uh, upon you. If let's say you are a five out of 10 blood pool, it didn't intrude upon you at all. However, yeah, it, it just it, felt like an abstract pool of like power yeah. points, effectively. Yeah. yeah, which is again like I like I've hinted at before. We have played like twenty years of Vampire, or we've been involved with this this game. So it's not like we don't like this <laughs> the the blood pool thing, but this is a different deal. So if you're a five out of ten blood pool, yeah, maybe you're looking at it being like mm, I can't really can't really like go and bust out the moves if if I need to uh, that much anyway before I need to fill up. Whereas in V5, if you're at three hunger, you're starting to look at your pool being, oh, well, so if I'm trying to do this thing, I have five dice, three of which are hunger dice. I might flip the fuck out and, and do something that I didn't intend to because I'm yeah. I'm hungry and I can't control myself. And just, just to explain to anyone listening and may not be familiar with it, the way hunger dice work is when you're creating your dice pool for your attribute plus your skill for whatever role your hunger rating a number of dice equal to your hunger rating are hunger dice so the game re recommends that you represent those as like a different colored dice obviously they recommend red because it's a vampire game and it's all about that blood yo blood and the the idea is as we were saying earlier if you if you get like most of your successes on your hunger dice, it's this messy success. However, if you if you fail, you can potentially get these messy criticals. And now, does the does the um, the messy failures does that involve when you you get successes on your hunger dice, but you still fail? How does that work? Yeah, sorry, my uh, my computer was uh, freezing up there for a minute. So. Um... The um, the messy critical requires that you roll a critical, which is uh, at least two tens uh, on your on your roll, and one of those tens has to be on your uh, hunger dice. Yeah, and um, oh, I will have to. Well, yeah. So the bestial failure, I think. I have so many versions of Vampire up in my head that it's kind of... Uh, getting, okay. yeah. So the bestial failure, as far as I remember it uh, right now off the top of my head, is uh, you don't succeed in your roll and you roll at least one one on your hunger dice. I will have to check that. Or, or rather, John will check that. Yeah, here we go. Bestial failure, page 207. Here we go. So yeah, as you were saying, messy critical... A critical win in which one or more ten is on the hunger dice. A yep. bestial failure is a failed roll. You've not got enough successes to reach the difficulty in which one or more hunger dice comes up as a one. Yeah, that yep. means your beast, according to the book, that means your beast has manifested inopportunately or excessively, or your character's failure has angered your beast, and you, you may be forced to act out compulsions, uh, various things like that. But basically, your beast has got the better of you as part perhaps because of this failure and again what we say the old mechanics perfectly serviceable yet you could play it as blood pooled bullet food superheroes but you you could still put flavor on top of it and role play it and it it was serviceable yeah. it yeah. worked perfectly fine yeah which is what we've been doing for <laughs> yeah exactly like yeah. 20 years now <laughs> but to, to me it seems like the the mechanics in the new game they specifically mechanically support the the idea that it's supposed to be a horror game it's yeah. supposed to be it's supposed to be a game of these immortal and very powerful creatures 
but each time they tap into that power, each time they use those abilities, they're they're risking this sort of darker side of them, this blood fueled monster that one day they become, running away with them and sliding them one step closer to this sort of abyss of just this never ending nightmare of blood and death that yeah. a vampire if they, if, if they ever completely sort of like lose themselves they can become what's known as a white and they are literally just a beast that lives to kill and eat there is nothing of their human side left yep and uh, the the really exciting thing for me is that you yeah okay so you use your fancy vampire moves your vampire abilities that's how you become more hungry of course you become more hungry as time goes on as well but after you've done that after you did the great vampire thing with your vampire powers you're now hungrier and everything you do now is overshadowed by the fact that you're hungry you you, you want to eat and you you don't want to do the thing that you're trying to do which yeah. is like researching the originator of vampires or whatever the shit you're trying to do or you're trying to convince your human friend to drive you to the blood bank so you can like get in the back and get get that sweet sweet plasma uh, and you roll your thing you're really hungry when you're trying to convince your human friend and you you roll a bestial failure and you rip their head off and that that's not what you intended to do but <laughs> they they took more convincing that your hungry angry vampire nature was willing to deal with and they became a, a nuisance and you dealt with it and now you get to deal with uh, damage to your uh, humanity and also a body. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like I say, as, as we've said previously, I, I know we're both fans of games where the mechanics specifically support and enable the type of play that the game is trying to represent. So I know we've talked about previously, we've talked about Power of the Apocalypse doing that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But, and I feel, the, the sort of v5 is very much going the same way and i think all credit to the people who've designed it they've obviously looked at it and gone like it, it's not as though the previous systems were like completely beyond redemption or didn't work in some way uh -huh. but they were like right well it, it works it's all right it's functional uh -huh. but you have to sort of put a lot on top to make it the sort of game that it's yep. supposed to be whereas they're saying oh we can do more from a sort of game design point of view to to sort of point you towards that style of game. Yeah, and like let's take uh, V20 because it's it's the I suppose the amalgamated monolith of previous editions of Vampire. It's a, an ex expansive toolbox for Vampire games, whereas V5 there's there's a lot in V5 which ties into what I'm about to say. V5 is a very sharply focused game about young vampires trying to somehow deal with their existence in a modern world that is extremely dangerous to vampires and that's that's a very different deal from being handed all of vampire from across the history of vampire and being told you can do anything that's in this book yeah yeah most definitely um uh, like you say the this game in particular and how they've sort of how they've advanced the setting has sort of done a lot to reinforce that because just to give a very sort of brief rundown of some of the events that have changed in the setting effectively a lot of old ass powerful vampires have started waking up in the middle east all of the sect pretty much known as the sabbat were like oh the elder vampires are arising that's our deal let's go and give them like six of cain's best and like dabblerize them so they've so most of them have gone to the east in return, these massively powerful vampires have used like the powers of their blood to go, oh, right, I'm going to need some reinforcements. So they call on all this sort of older children with this beckoning that draws them to the east. So in one foul swoop, you've, you've got rid of the Sabbat as a massive sort of monolithic sect, and you've also skimmed all the really old vampires off the top of like the camera and the anarch. So as younger vampires you now have a lot more sort of room to play in it's not a case of going like oh, okay i'm a younger vampire so maybe if i sort of knuckle down and I, I like work for the man for like 500 years maybe i'll get a few scraps off the prince's table it's a case of like oh well the if there is a prince still 
which isn't a certainty. I mean, there might not be. Yeah, there there isn't, certainly isn't in our game. Then they're going to be a lot younger, a lot less entrenched. The power base isn't going to be so extensive. So you can make more of a mark as a younger vampire. And by the same token, I'm a, I'm a massive fan of the, the Sabbat as a sect in the game. But to my mind, this background is like return them to what they were in second edition, where they were like the kindred sort of like bogeymen, you know? Yeah, boogeymen. Yeah, people yeah. talked about the Sabbat in like hushed whispers, or, you know, they're the monsters who've like seen too much. You know, you don't want to go down that dark path. Whereas they, they became sort of a bit less as they were more explained because they weren't as scary. Whereas now, because most of them have disappeared off, any Sabbat that have gone to the East and come back, it means they're like double hard and double vicious because they've survived. Yeah, or or it might literally be a five thousand year old dude wearing like Joe Boy Billy Bob skin, <laughs> which is that's not better. <laughs> yeah, so it's like it's returned them to these these shadowy sort of bogeymen who are like lurking in the darkness, and sort of they're they're the monsters that the monsters fear effectively. So yeah. I, I love the fact that the background's emphasising that. But also, again, it's tied back into giving player characters more room to manoeuvre with their character. So, yeah, of course, if, if you go out in the street and you start like, getting your vampire on in like, full view of everybody, yeah, the, the second Inquisition is going to be knocking at your door or the vampires are going to be trying to put the smack down on you. Of course, mm-hmm. that, that's still going to happen, but it's not a case of you're going to you're going to make some minor trespass and you're going to have like the scourge like kicking down the door at your haven and like coming for you and dragging you up in front of like a Camarilla tribunal. As yeah. could sometimes happen like in older days. Yeah. And of course that varies by city, obviously, as, as everything does in Vampire. But you, you could definitely have these, as we are playing in the this sort of like modern London where it, it's, it's, basically the apocalypse or the, the post-apocalypse for the vampires yeah. where where the um, uh, British version of the Second Inquisition just, just like decapitated the, the whole vampire society in London. Yeah, so for, for anyone who doesn't know, we are using the Fall of London campaign book. Now, this is like a pre-written campaign, but which we're not actually using, but it also... It basically chronicles the the rise of what's known as Operation Antigen UK, which is the the the, the public face of the Second Inquisition. It's groups of people who have worked like with influence, who have worked out vampires exist, and very quietly they go around setting their people in place, getting ready for it. Then, once most of the vampires have left and gone to the east, and there's only a few left, they make their move and disguising it as like terrorist attacks sort of domestic violence, stuff like that. They effectively, as Johanna said, like chop the head off kindred society, certainly in London in this campaign. And that obviously throws kindred society into complete disarray. Effectively, at the end of the campaign, you're in this like vampire post-apocalypse, as Johannes was saying, and that's where we're running our game. So the, the Camarilla is effectively no longer a thing in london mm-hmm. because there's not enough vampires to maintain it the what they've got is they've got scraps of land where there's various landlords as they're known in slang and the idea is that kindred are now just holding on to little patches of ground because you can only hold on to a place if you're powerful enough to maintain it but also cunning enough to stay below the radar of operation antigen which although it's not organizing the massive operations anymore it is still there it is still on the lookout for Kindred, and anyone who gets too far out of line risks drawing their attention. Even in the more like established uh, settings, of course, they, uh, they've they always made uh, a Chicago book, because that's the first book that they made, and it's sort of emblematic. It's sort of the blueprint for the uh, sort of typical standard by the book uh, Camarilla City. Yeah, like um, you say, it's like it's like the iconic city for like yeah, Lord of Darkness, it's, isn't it's, it? Yeah, it's the it's the one that you would buy off the shelf in a in a supermarket. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, as far as vampire cities go, <laughs> a very 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 sort of uh, it, it's it's yeah it's the archetype of of a like a Camarilla city, and um, even in in that the newest version very much puts a a fresh coat of paint on it because there's. Newer folks, even even though because it's it's the it, it, Chicago has a lot of history uh, yeah. with, in vampire, so they do have some of the the old uh, vampires that were put 
in Chicago. They do have some of that still around, but still, like most of the uh, population, fairly young as far as the positions of authority and influence go. So again, uh, even with the sort of emblematic Camarilla power structure city like Chicago, uh, the the stronghold of modern Camarilla, yeah, is it's it's still being run by fairly young folks and even if you have some of the like incredibly old people around they're sort of like sitting back and being like oh what's this new new world that i've woken up into i will i will see how the children play uh, instead of being uh like i am the overlord now and you will bow to me yeah and to to, to come back to the, the sort of session zero that we did the other night, we spent about three or four hours just sort of like very meticulously going through the, the sort of character gen summary step by step. And now, obviously, I know that four hours that seems like a long time. It's like an entire session uh-huh. devoted to character gen. And if, if you're talking about sort of older vampire, I'll be like, yeah, I need what? Maybe half an hour yep. to gen a character if that but as myself and Johannes were saying that's with umpteen decades of experience doing <laughs> yeah. that and also the result at the end of it would just be I have my character that is all yep. whereas we w- with varying degrees of people with familiarity with the game and we've got a couple of people who've not played it at all I've played it a bit Johannes has played it a bit more than me uh-huh. like I say a couple of people not not done it at all so we went through it quite slowly, quite sort of methodically, trying to make sure everyone understood everything. And that, that's just the way I preferred to go. I'd rather spend, I'd rather have spent eight hours doing it if everyone understood it, rather uh-huh. than going to the first session and have people be like, oh, I'm not really sure what's going on. I don't know how I can get involved. Uh-huh. But the result at the end of those four hours wasn't just, oh, we've got four player characters, Jen. The result at the end was like, right, we've got your haven detailed out, the location that your coteries controls detail out we've got this whole like sort of 20 plus supporting cast of NPCs uh-huh. detailed out we know all your backgrounds we know what sort of coterie you are we know that your your coterie is trying to maintain the masquerade and like stop any vampiric excess in your area of control and we pretty much had the plot for the first session yeah. ready, ready to go yeah. I've, yeah, I've literally right got there. And the the plot we, we decided to go for, because obviously I discussed this with the player characters, because I want the, the first session to be like a sort of gentle lead-in, so we can all get used to throwing a few of the dice pools, making a few checks, making rouse checks, you working out how hunger works, stuff like that. Both for myself as a GM, because I've not run it before, and also for the players, so we're all sort of getting used to it together. So we decided that we were going to go for the idea there's a young vampire coming to their territory who maybe doesn't really know about the masquerade and stuff like that, or maybe they just don't care. And they're like doing a vampire thing. And their coterie is going to be trying to sort of stop the egregious breaches of the masquerade because that's the type of coterie they want to play. So all I've literally got to do now is drop in a few stats, a few ideas, a few places, and we are pretty much good to go. The actual planning I need to do for the first session is minimal. Most of it's been done for me. So as far as I'm concerned, like four hours to get all the characters genned, get like a vast array of NPCs genned, a huge chunk of the setting done, and also a huge part of the prep for the first session done. That seems like pretty good going for four hours to me. Yeah, and that's the <clears throat> that's the bit that uh, makes it differ from the previous. Although in previous editions, yeah, you could bring your, you could spend your points, you could buy some some allies and whatnot. Yeah, of course you yeah. could. However, in this, like, there, there's many more <laughs> that everyone will have regardless of any points you spend. Uh, so, uh, as a as a direct result and because we use the co- like the criteria rules whereby you get a domain so we we have sort of like uh staked out uh, an area of london uh, where we hold domain and uh, are <clears throat> basically setting us up ourselves up as the vampiric authority in that part of the london area and we have basically created this like micro setting within the larger setting of london yeah. Uh, which now you can use to basically we've just handed you a bunch of Legos and be like, these are all the Legos that we're interested in. We have sort of themed them around these things. 
uh, just go, go. <laughs> yeah i mean for pretty much as a gm all i and, and i've said this i've said this before i'll say it again as far as i'm concerned if a player character puts something on their sheet it is in my best interest as a gm to use that in the game so just to give like a, a random example we had uh, ambrose was saying like one of the one of the sort of fighting specialities was like fighting against werewolves and uh-huh. he was like he was like oh could i take that and will there be werewolves in the game i'm like well by default because it's a vampire game it's not going to focus on werewolves however if you choose fighting against werewolves as a speciality i know you're interested in werewolves so it's in my best interest to make sure there'll be some werewolf stuff in the game because if you guys like you say you're handing me this big list of like here's the stuff we like here's what we want to see in the session It'd be foolish of me as a GM to not use that. Yeah, you, you, we hand you, and and also I would like to know like how <laughs> Ambrose's guy has a speciality in fighting werewolves. Like, there's a story there that I want to hear. But exactly. uh, <laughs> if we hand you uh, a list of things which are themed around recreating the underworld movies, yeah, and you're like, no. I will have this spy thriller set in the 70s Soviet Union. <laughs> I was like, what? John, yeah. like, did you read the, the list? <laughs> that, that's it, exactly. I mean, what, I, I, know there's, I know session zeros aren't for everyone, and like, not everyone likes them, and that's, that's fair enough. But one of the big advantages I've seen for me as a GM, certainly if it's like a new group or a group I'm not entirely familiar with. So if, if I was running a game for like you and Matthew, well, we've gamed together loads, I can reasonably intuit the stuff you're probably going to be interested in. But certainly for a new group, the session zero for me, as well as creating all this great stuff, which I can use, it gives me time to sort of like work out how the group's relating to each other, Mm -hmm. what sort of things they like in the game. Obviously we were chatting as we were doing it. You get a feel for like what sort of bits people are interested in. So, and it's all about playing to your audience basically, because obviously I want to make sure as a GM I have a good time running it, so there'll be things in there that I like. But I also want to make sure that all the players have fun playing it. So yeah. why would I not put in the stuff that they're interested in? Yeah. It's like if if you don't like say if you'd all gone like, oh yeah, we we want the game to be set in Russia and we're all playing like Soviet era spies, I could have been like, yeah, that, that's fine. I'll, I'll run with that. That's not a problem. Mm-hmm. But because we've not got any of that stuff in here, I'm like, right, okay, that's obviously not meant to be the focus of this game. That's absolutely yeah. fine. Yep. I think that's. Uh, a very strong approach to games in general. Now, there's a there's a sort of a, a very hard to define like where it gets to like not be so much of a thing. And I think we could definitely. This is a very short detour. I don't mean to go on a rant about this, That's but fine, like if if you if you pick your choice of OSR game, so let's say yeah. uh, old school essentials, we're, we're playing that. It's not so much a thing if I, I've, I I'm a wizard uh, and then Matthew picks a fighter. Like it's it's yeah. not so much about like oh he's in- interested in a sword and I'm interested in a book. Yeah, of course, yeah. Because <laughs> it's the the interest bit is extraneous to the characters because of the game that we're playing. But yeah, yeah especially in Vampire, like yeah, I, I would like 100 uh, percent of the times when I run Vampire, I, I will look at what the characters are because that's what people are interested in by default because that's the kind of game it is and you get easy enjoyment from doing the exact thing like so if well, for example for my character uh, being a, a sort of like uh, ex uh, inquisition agent so like a former like project antigen operative that got nabbed and turned to a vampire yeah that, that in it, itself is my flag to you as the person running the game i i want to I want the antigen guys in in the game somehow because I I used to be one. <laughs> yeah. So, and I mean, for, for me, as you were saying, we've created this sort of like microcosm of, of a mini setting within mm-hmm. London. So for me, really, rather than me having to detail out the whole of London, obviously London's a vast city. There's lots of different stuff you do in it, but it could also be quite overwhelming because it's like you know you've got all these different like boroughs, yeah. everything. Going, where would you start? Whereas for me, all I've got to do is once we've decided what borough you guys are in, I know there's going to be certain things in there in our version of it because of mm-hmm. what you guys have got. So, for instance, like you're, you're, you're talking about your guys have sort of been involved with like a mortuary and being involved with yeah. a church. So we know, right, there's, there's a church presence, there's a mortuary, there's mm-hmm. a graveyard. Um, yeah. we, we know that uh, 
we know that our Tremere that Greg's playing, uh, MC Supernova, is like big, <laughs> big in the um, big in the sort of rave subculture. So we know, and he has like a big club as his haven. Mm-hmm. So we know there's like a huge like rave club in that district. He's got mm-hmm. fame, so it's probably quite well known throughout the city. And I just need, I just can just focus my attention down on that one yep. borough. And obviously, you can go outside it; you're not restricted. Yep. But I don't have to detail out the rest of the city no. in such exhaustive detail because I've already got this borough sort of mm-hmm. defined. And all I've really got to do is take the bits you guys have given me, sort of fill in a few of the gaps, and elaborate on the stuff that you guys have already created, mm-hmm. and, we, and we are good to go. Yeah, and add in your specific interests as well, because yeah, you, you have been entirely outside of the process here, because you don't need to be involved, because we are creating the stuff for you to use, at least like uh, from the start, from the get-go, you can use the stuff that we have created, and then you can bring in whatever you want on top of all that, and tie yeah. different things together that we didn't, because your input is added on top, and once we're, because we can pl- probably play, if we take like a district of london we could play the entire game there like just yeah. never go outside Quite so easily. we we could we could do that and we could also do it so that like we start there in our own place with the with the church and the the graveyard and the mortuary and the the rave club and whatnot and then maybe we get an envoy like from the landlord in the in the next district and uh then we're involved with them and we need to go there to do a thing and uh start expanding the sort of reach uh, of our coterie yeah right well yep. I, I think that's probably enough for wibbling about the yep. um, the world of darkness for this but like i say i i, I don't know about yourself i mean obviously i i was more than happy with the the session zero i thought we got an awful lot done yeah like i say although from the outset if you say oh four hours to gen characters it seems like a lot of time but when you factor in all the additional stuff that's been created mm-hmm. i think we got an awful lot done in terms of the setting the npcs yeah. future future adventures all done in that four hours so i was more than happy yeah we and basically it, set up the game uh, say, yeah, and, it, the so. and it was nice to, to give you guys a chance to sort of like get to know each other and start talking amongst each yeah. other because you're going to be playing these characters who are going to be associating and working with each other yeah. so you also need to make sure that like the, the player group is capable mm-hmm. of playing those characters working together, which seems like is certainly going to be the case from the group we have. Mm-hmm. But if yeah. there had been any obvious sort of friction or problems, there's more likelihood of me noticing beforehand and being able to do something about it, yeah. whatever that might be, than if we just jump straight into a game and then like three sessions in, we're like, oh, this group's not really gelling. It's not really like working together. Mm-hmm. So I, think, I think it's definitely a worthwhile investment, certainly with a game like this that can deal with some pretty sort of like heavy emotional yeah. themes it's definitely worth doing a session zero yeah and we had some talk about that like uh like topics to include like yeah. we we did talk some uh, about some of that because one of the players brought up like hey so i have this thing that's related to my characters like is it okay to bring this kind of thing up in game yeah. Uh, which is also like yeah of course in, in especially in a in a game like vampire where <laughs> Ostensibly, like you're, you're all playing murderers, like serial murdering cannibals, is what you're playing. Like, yeah. Let's not kid ourselves. That's what we're doing. So it can get intense yeah. <laughs> at times, and you're probably involved in a lot, like a vast array of very bad things. Aside from that, as well. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, because we're we're going to be sort of streaming and recording the game, it, I think it was a very wise thing of uh, the player who brought it up. To say yeah. like, oh, because I know it's going to be streaming, it's going to be available to the public. Mm-hmm. Like, how far can we go with these things? And I was able to say, well, my preference is if something starts getting a bit too dark, we can easily fade to black and then like cut in a short while later. And I, I use the example of a scene with someone being tortured. You don't need to mm-hmm. play out every last detail of the torture. You you sort of do the lead up enough to get a flavour of what's about to happen. Then you can zoom out a little bit, make those dice rolls and put mm-hmm. back in as the guy's like, okay, okay, I'll tell you what you want to know. Mm-hmm. And no one needs to be made like uncomfortable because of that, but you've still got the sort of the broad strokes of what's yeah. going on. People still know that like, yeah, this has happened. It's morally repugnant. It's horribly mm-hmm. unpleasant. It's caused physical harm to someone. And you've potentially lost a bit of yourself while doing that. 
but we don't need to make the players feel uncomfortable by sort yeah. of going into excruciating detail about it. Yeah, we don't need to wallow in it if that's yeah. not the thing that we want to do. So. Well, that's it. I mean, obviously, it's a horror game, so mm -hmm. we're not trying to sort of sugarcoat the fact that, like you say, vampires are murderous, blood-drinking cannibals at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. That's not a bit around the bush. They are. That's, that's just a fact. That's exactly what they are. Yeah. So we're not trying to sort of shy away from that. So there will be unpleasant things portrayed in the game, but it's still a game. We still want the players to be enjoying it. We don't want the players to be like, oh, you know, I felt like really uncomfortable and sort of horrible, like out of character because mm -hmm. of that game. Yeah. And there will be, as a side note, there will be some dumb jokes and references yeah, being of course, made. Of course there will be. Because we're, we're all fun loving criminals, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's. I, I think it's a natural thing to sort of when you're playing a game, especially like a more a more in depth sort of emotional game for mm -hmm. say like vampire to want to break that tension every now and again by cracking a joke or or yeah. by making like a an underworld reference or whatever because mm -hmm. we've all seen loads of vampire films. We all know how it goes. Yeah, that, yeah. that's just a natural thing. And I think as a GM, rather than trying to sort of fight against it, like well, you're not taking this game 100 percent seriously. Just, just like let people have fun. Remember, it's a game. Just like go with it. You, you can still build up tension. You can still build up an atmosphere, but you have to sort of keep in your mind that it, it is a game. And I, I always hate it when people say like, "Oh, role playing is just a game." Because I'm like, it's a game, but that, that yeah. doesn't that doesn't lessen the worth of it. Yeah, it's it's that that's like. So what are you comparing it to then? Like what? Because <laughs> it's it's less than something because it's just quote unquote. Yeah. Again? And it's like, it's like you, you can say you can say that about anything. You could um, you you could pick up a, an important like holy text and say it's just a book, it's just pages, yeah. just words. Yeah. But it means something beyond that to people. And I think even if you're not, I'm not talking about using like RPGs for like teaching purposes or stuff like that. Although you can mm -hmm. do that. But even if it's just just in inverted commas a game, which you're just doing to have fun for entertainment. That, that doesn't make it any less important or sort of lessen the impact of it because of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just as a very quick, like, um, uh, ending, ending point to this is like, okay, so you have different kinds of games in, in the world. Yeah. Just look at how much people invest in football and b for Americans, I mean, soccer. So that, it gets intense. <laughs> like yeah. People invest in sports a lot. That, and that's it. And I mean, playing. It's just I mean, as that, a fan. <laughs> I mean, like soccer or like football isn't really my bag, but I would never say, oh, well, it's just a game. It's just people like kicking a ball about because obviously that's not what it is. That's yeah, not to them. It is to the people like... who are involved in it. <laughs> yeah. It, it's something much more. And I think exactly the same is true of all. Yeah. So like, right. if you like something, that's cool. And, you yeah. shouldn't feel bad about that. Yeah, you shouldn't feel bad about it. Just, just own it. It's a game. It's something you, or whatever. It's an yeah. activity you enjoy. So it therefore has meaning for you and whoever you're playing it with. Yeah, and that's that's the important part. Exactly. So I think that's probably enough for now. Thank you yeah. very much for joining me, Johannes, and we will wrap up there. We hope you've enjoyed that episode. If you want to get in touch with us, you can drop us an email. The address is rddrpgpodcast at gmail.com. Or if you want to leave us a voicemail message, you can head over to our page on speakpipe.com and that will allow you to leave a 90 second voicemail. And you might even be featured in a future show. There's a link to this included in the show notes, as well as a link to our website and other places where you can contact us. We hope you enjoyed the show and we'll see you soon.